Hi everyone! In this video we're going to be talking about our auxiliary or characteristic equations, but the ones that have complex roots. So we previously talked about our linear second order differential equation and its roots um, for its auxiliary equation. This time the new part is that the roots are going to be complex. So our auxiliary characteristic equation, ar squared plus br plus c equals zero, which is associated with what we've seen before, our homogeneous equation. Notice this is our second order differential equation that equals zero. This equation has complex conjugate roots of the form where one root is alpha plus i beta, the other root is alpha minus i beta, if b squared minus 4ac is negative. Okay, real quick, this should look somewhat familiar. This is from your quadratic formula. This is inside the radicand. We call this the discriminant because it um, distinguishes between our types of roots. So if the square root part of your uh, quadratic formula is negative, then you're going to get the imaginary number i in it, or complex numbers. And so that's what's happening here. And so remember i is just square root negative 1 by definition. Um, some textbooks use j for this. We use i. And alpha is going to be the part, if you think of your quadratic equation or formula, um, before the plus and minus sign, so negative b over 2a. And then beta is after the plus and minus sign. But notice here, normally it says for your quadratic formula b squared minus 4ac. We have that flipped around. We have a negative b squared and a positive 4ac because we factor out the square root negative 1 and we call that i. Okay, So alpha is going to be the real part of your root, beta is going to be the imaginary part, beta i. Alright, so how do your answers look to your differential equation up here if the roots are complex? And then quick note, um, complex numbers come in pairs and they're called conjugate pairs. So uh, one of them has a plus sign, one of them has a minus sign. So we've seen this before. Our solutions are of the form y equals e to the rt power. And so now this time, r is getting replaced with alpha plus i beta and alpha minus i beta. And so this leads into our general solution, which again, we've also seen before. And so that's going to look like y as our answer. That's our solution to our differential equation up here, equals some constant c1 times e to the alpha plus i beta t power plus another constant c2 times e to the alpha minus i beta times t power. Okay, now the new part here, uh, other than introducing these complex roots, is the way we write our general answer. And this is because we can actually use Euler's formula to express a complex function in terms of a familiar real function. In our case, um, we're rewriting e to the i theta in terms of cosine theta and plus i sine theta. So I don't have the proof written out for you here, but hopefully you accept this, that this is equivalent to our general solution right above it. Um, if you want to prove it, you will basically separate uh, using your rules of exponents. This is e to the alpha, or alpha t, times e to the i beta t. And then what you'd actually have to do is you'd act, have to use a Maclaurin series and expand the idea of e to the i theta. You can rewrite it in terms of cosine and sine, and then go from there just to get to your proof of why this is equivalent. So don't worry about proving it. Just know that we're going to be using this version down here for our general solution, the version that involves cosines and sines. So let's try this out. We're going to try this example. We're going to solve this initial value problem, y double prime plus 2y prime plus 2y equals 0. And we have some initial conditions for the first derivative and the 0 if derivative. So remember how this goes. We did this previously. You start with your auxiliary or characteristic equation. And the shortcut to getting that is just kind of looking at your coefficients. So this is 1 y double prime, so that's 1r squared. 2y prime, so 2r, and then 2y is just plus 2. Okay, And then whatever way you can solve this, you um, could try to factor, uh, if it was real roots, which this is not, you could try to factor um, or use other techniques, but we already know we're talking about complex roots, 
And so we're going to jump right into using our quadratic formula, but I'm going to use the separated version for alpha and beta. So alpha is negative b over 2a. In our case, that's negative 2 over 2 times 1, and that's negative 1. And then beta, plug in a is 1 from right here, c is 2, and then b is also 2, and we get that beta is 1. Okay, and so our roots, our complex roots, look like negative 1 plus i and negative 1 minus i. So once we have those roots, we're going to plug those into our general solution. And so here's our general solution. Notice um, nothing's changed yet, but now when I plug in alpha, I put a negative 1 everywhere. There was an alpha. And then when I plug in beta, I put an invisible 1 everywhere there was a beta. Okay, so if this was not an initial value problem, I would actually be done here. I would stop with my general solution. But because we have some initial conditions given, I'm going to keep going so that I can find C1 and C2. All right, so starting with our zeroth derivative, if I plug in zero, it should equal zero. So everywhere I have a t, I'm putting zero into our general solution right here. And then I'm just going to simplify, okay? So notice we just get C1 plus C2 is zero because this is like C1 times one times one plus zero. Remember, cosine of zero is one, sine of zero is zero, e to the zero is one. Okay, so just a bunch of times ones plus zeros there. All right, so we have one equation with two unknowns, which means we definitely need a second equation to be able to solve for C1 and C2. Now, what we need to do next, because our second initial condition uses the first derivative, is we have to differentiate our function. So it looks a little daunting, but it's not so bad. Just notice that you have to use your product rule. So let me see if I can underline some stuff for you. So from your original function, you have a product of two factors. So you have the first factor times the second in your first term. So when you differentiate, you need to use your product rule. So this right here is the derivative of the first factor and then times the second factor and then plus the first factor times the derivative of the second factor. And then you just do the same thing again for the second term back here. And so once you have that derivative, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Then we can plug in our second initial condition. So everywhere we had a t, we're putting a zero, and we know that this should equal two. So after simplifying, notice there's cosine of zero is gonna be one, sine of zero is gonna be zero, and then e to the zero is one, and so everywhere uh, we have those, we can replace them with ones and zeros, and we end up with negative c1 plus i times c1 minus c2 minus i times c2 should equal two. And um, taking our first equation from our first uh, initial condition, we can use substitution now. So from the first equation, we can replace every c2 in our second equation with negative c1 and then just combine like terms. And so notice what you'll get if you solve for C1. You'll get 1 over i, but I wanted to show you the algebra on this real quick uh, because 1 over i is the same thing as negative i. If you just rewrite i as square root negative 1 and then you rationalize the denominator, you're going to get a negative 1 on bottom and an i in the numerator. So 1 over i is the same thing as negative i. And then that means C2 is positive i. And putting those all back into our solution, we have the following answer. So every, our C1 got replaced with negative i, our C2 got replaced with i. And so we actually are going to simplify this just a little bit using what we know from trig. So we can use one of our trig identities and rewrite this a little bit more simplified. And then one more time, do a little bit more simplification with the i times i and the negative 1, invisible negative 1 technically. And we end up with a final nice condensed version of our answer. Y equals 2 e to the t, negative t times sine t. And so this equation satisfies our original initial value problem. Next, let's talk real quick about a lemma and then a resulting um, fact that we could say about our complex conjugate roots. And then we'll do another example. So the lemma says if we have this complex number z equals u plus iv,
If that's the solution to our second order dif linear differential homogeneous equation here, um, then u and v are real valued solutions to this equation. And so, okay, so the point of showing you that lemma is actually because it leads to this result here, and this is the one we're interested in. If the auxiliary equation has roots alpha plus or minus i beta, then two linearly independent solutions are e to the alpha t times cosine beta t and e to the alpha t times sine beta t. And then what we could do is we could say our general solution is of this form, y equals some constant c1 times e to the alpha t cosine beta t plus c2 e to the alpha t sine beta t. All right, so let's look at this last example here. Determine the equation of motion for a spring system when all this information is given. The mass is 36 kilograms, damping is 12 kilograms per second, stiffness is 37 kilograms per second squared. When we plug in zero into our motion equation, we get 0.7 meters, and then when we plug into the derivative, uh, zero, we get 0.1 meters per second. And then, so we're finding the equation of motion first of all, that's actually gonna be y. And then after that, we'll answer how many seconds it takes for the mass to first cross the equilibrium point. Okay, so we talked about this in the past, but recall our differential equation for a mass spring oscillator has the following format, where m or mass for inertia, b is our damping, and k is our stiffness. So all we have to do here is just plug in all the numbers we were given, and notice we have an initial value problem that we're going to solve in order to find our uh, equation of motion, y of t. So we're just solving the second order differential equation and using our initial conditions to get our constants. Okay, so jumping right into our same process, we're going to find the characteristic or auxiliary equation. Notice it's just 36 r squared, 12 r plus 37. And so let's say I didn't know this was gonna have complex roots. It is because we're talking about it in this section, but let's say you didn't know. You could just plug into your quadratic formula and start simplifying. And what you'll notice is you're going to get a negative radicand here. And so it's definitely gonna have complex roots because of that. And then once you simplify, you get negative one six plus or minus i. And so alpha is the negative one six, the real part. And then beta is the coefficient on i. So in this case, it's an invisible one. Okay? So we got our alpha and beta from our complex roots. And then we plug into our general solution, the new form of it that we just talked about from our uh, result right after our lemma. And so we have y equals some constant c1 times e to the negative t over 6 power. That's where alpha was plugged in, times cosine 1 times t, because beta was 1, plus another constant c2, e to the negative t over 6 power, sine of t. Okay? So this is our general solution. If we didn't have these initial conditions, we would stop here. But we do have initial conditions, so we're going to keep going. And so let's start by plugging in 0 into our function. And we know the result should be 1 point, or 0 0.7. And so if we simplify this, we end up just getting that C1 is 0 0.7. So we were able to find one of our constants pretty quickly, our constant coefficients. Then the second initial condition, we have to find the derivative first. So going back to your general solution here, differentiate this. You do have to use your product rule. So the first term is a product. And when you differentiate it, you get these two terms here. And then the second term is also a product. And when you differentiate that using your product rule, you're gonna get these two terms here, okay? Now that you have the derivative, you can go ahead and plug in your condition that you were given, that when you plug in zero, you should get 0.1. And so plugging in zero for every t, we know the result should be 0.1. And after we simplify, and we use what we figured out earlier, that C1 was 0.7. So we simplify, plug in 0.7 for C1. We figure out that C2 is 13 over 60. Now this is a, I could put this as a decimal, but this is not a nice decimal. It doesn't terminate. So to avoid a rounding error, I just leave it as a fraction here. Okay, 
So then our equation of motion, we found it officially. We plug in our uh, numbers we got for C1 and C2. And then this is the first half of the question. The equation of motion of this spring system, depending on the t time input, this will give us the displacement of uh, a mass on our spring at the time t. So now, when will the mass cross the equilibrium point? And so that means that the displacement is actually zero from equilibrium. So we just set our equation of motion equal to zero. And that's what we're looking for to answer this question. So notice it says when, letting us know that we're solving for time. So we're going to solve this equation for t. All right, so let's do a little bit of algebra work here. I'm going to factor out a cosine. So notice I, this sine became a tangent when I factored out a cosine. And then I'm also going to factor out the e to the negative t over 6. And then notice this is a product of three factors that equals 0. And so the only one that actually is going to equal 0 is the last factor. So real quick, e to the negative t over 6, power, that's never 0. And then over here, Cosine t is never going to be 0 in this situation because, remember, we factored it out here, and this became tangent. So if cosine was 0, this, was at, this would actually be undefined. So the only factor that can actually be 0 is this last one. So we're solving this equation for t. And so we get tangent of t is negative 42 over 13. And you need tangent inverse in order to find t. However, I have to remind you of something from trig. When you have inverse trig functions, we had restricted domains for them back when you first learned about these. And so for arctangent, it's only defined um, between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. If you want to think about your unit circle, that's quadrants 4 and 1. And so what you want to look at here, if we just kind of keep um, thinking about tangent of this value t equals negative 42 over 13, that number is not really within that domain, okay? So negative 42 thirteenths is about negative 3.23. That is not in between negative pi over two and positive pi over two. And so when this happens, you actually have to just do a, a quick adjustment and you can add pi to your value here. So to get t, you're gonna use tangent inverse of your value, negative 42 thirteenths, but then add pi so that it's defined on the domain of arctangent. Okay, so this hopefully this sounds a little familiar if you are kind of remembering some stuff from trig, but if not, that's okay. Um, just whenever you're using your inverse trig functions, uh, be sure to look up the domain of them. And so, final answer, after about 1.87 seconds, the mass will cross the equilibrium point. All right, so that's it for this one, where we learned about complex roots of our characteristic or auxiliary equation.